My name's Kelly Richards and I'm a research analyst here at AIC um, and this morning I'm going to be talking to you about juvenile justice in Australia. So what I'd like to do is start by just giving an overview of juvenile justice in Australia and then I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, research projects that we've run here at AIC. One of those is an ongoing monitoring program and the other um, was a much smaller sort of an ad hoc research project. So hopefully I'll have time to get to that one. So a really important thing to grasp up front is that the whole idea of juvenile justice is essentially historically specific. And what I mean by that is that in the past, until about the mid-19th century, there was no such thing as a juvenile justice system. And children in the West were essentially treated exactly like adults. So we know that children were, um, children as young as six were found in Pentridge prison um, and children were subject to things like hard labour and corporal punishment and capital punishment. Of course um, it's, it's widely agreed now that young people should be subject <coughs> to a separate system of justice and one that um, recognises that they are inexperienced um, and immature in comparison with adults. So by way of background, Australia is a signatory to a number of uh, United Nations instruments um, that seek to protect young people who come into contact with the criminal justice system. So these are uh, the Riyadh guidelines, the Beijing rules, the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the rules for the protection of juveniles who are deprived of their liberty. Domestically in Australia, each jurisdiction also has a piece of legislation that's specifically designed around juvenile justice. Now there are lots of differences uh, among these pieces of legislation. I'm not going to go into any of that now. Um, but I think what's really important is that there's also a great deal of overlap. So some of the key principles of juvenile justice actually cut across all of these separate pieces of legislation. So things like uh, the use of detention as a last resort for juveniles, um, that's represented in, in each of these pieces of legislation. Um, the, the main focus of each of these laws is essentially around diversion. So each of these uh, laws has a cautioning system for juveniles, um, it has some type of restorative justice process to which young people can be referred, um, and other sorts of diversionary measures. Um, before I go on though, it's it's pretty important to think about well, what, what is actually a juvenile um, and the concept of um, juvenile, the definition of a juvenile has actually shifted and changed quite a bit over the years. At the moment in every Australian jurisdiction except Queensland uh, a juvenile is defined as being aged between 10 and 17 inclusive. So the day you turn 18 you become an adult. In Queensland it's between 10 and and 16, so it's, it's just a year lower. As soon as you turn 17 in Queensland, you're legally defined as an adult. So in all jurisdictions, the minimum age of legal responsibility is 10. So that means that children aged under 10 simply cannot be charged with an offence. They cannot be held legally responsible for their actions. But what's really interesting is that, that this wasn't always the case and it isn't the case across the world. So again, this is something of an historical artefact. Um, so in some jurisdictions in Australia, even after um, a separate juvenile justice system was established, the age of criminal responsibility was much lower than 10 and in some instances was as low as 7. Um, but today we have a uniformity um, in terms of the minimum age of responsibility. Um, now that varies across countries as well, so in some of the states in America it's as low as 6, in other places in the world it's as high as 18. So each of those pieces of legislation uh, that I had on the previous slide also incorporates um, this doctrine, this legal doctrine called Dolly Inca Pax. Dolly Inca Pax, which always conjures up this image of some type of decapitated doll, um, but it's not. It's just a fancy sort of Latin term that literally means incapable of crime. Okay, incapable of crime or incapable of evil. So essentially it recognises that children learn the difference between right and wrong and between behaviours that are seriously wrong and simply, you know, naughty or mischievous <coughs> at different ages. So in Australia, all juveniles aged between 10 and 13, so until the day you turn 14, are considered to be dolly inca packs. So they're considered to be incapable of crime. So the interesting thing about this, um, about dolly inca packs, a lot of people think that it's 
a legal defence. It actually isn't. It's, it's a rebuttable legal presumption. So the presumption is already in favour of the child being incapable of committing a crime. So in court, the prosecution is responsible for rebutting um, this presumption of Dolly Incapax and proving that the juvenile knew the difference between right and wrong at the time of the offence. So a contested trial can only result in conviction uh, if the prosecution successfully rebuts this presumption. So this principle has been around a long time. It's been around since about the 14th century. Um, and it's also supported by the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. But there's been a lot of debate about whether we should retain it, uh, about its continued relevance, um, and about whether we should move that minimum age of 10 up or down. Most of you will be very familiar with this picture. This is taken from CCTV footage. Um, the, the small child in the picture is James Bolger, who was two, um, and the two young men, they were children really, um, were Rob Thompson and um, Venables, I can't remember his first name, John, John Venables, um, who were kidnapping James Bolger and who later tortured and murdered him. And this was, was an horrific case. Some of you will have seen this case, it came up again on 60 Minutes about three weeks ago. Um, so it's had a huge impact in the UK um, and also a bit of a flow on effect here. Um, and this case sort of um, was the impetus for um, a lot of debate around when children should be responsible for their actions and it effectively resulted in the abolition um, of that principle of Dolly Incapax in the UK. So that was abolished in 1998. Um, of course the important thing about that case was that the two offenders were <coughs> extremely young children. They were both 10. Um, from memory one of them was only just so it really raised that issue of when should young people be responsible for their actions. Um, the whole notion of Dolly Incapax has been derided in some quarters as something that people might use to simply you know, get away with bad behaviour. Another key sort of philosophical underpinning of juvenile justice in Australia <laughs> is the idea of welfare and justice. So Western juvenile justice systems are often characterised as um, it's alternating between a welfare model and a justice model. A welfare model is, is a bit like a rehabilitative model. So it focuses on the rehabilitation of the young person. It sees the young person's actions as uh, a result of family influence and, and community problems. Um, so in effect, it's, it's sort of the bleeding heart, uh, lefty sort of end of the spectrum. The justice model, on the other hand, is, is much harsher and it essentially sees young people as responsible for their actions, uh, it, seems, it sees them as people who choose to commit an offence and its focus is on punishment, so it sees the young person as deserving of punishment. And you'll often see in the literature that uh, this idea that, that the welfare and the justice model sort of, you know, they, they seesaw back and forth, so we have one of them and then, you know, so we have a welfare model and then people sort of say, oh, this is just, this is too soft on these young people. They should be held responsible for their actions. And then we sort of, you know, careen towards this other end of the spectrum um, where young people are punished quite harshly. And then people in the community say, well, they're being punished too harshly. They're not being rehabilitated. So John Braithwaite talks about the welfare justice seesaw. In reality, though, uh, those two models are, are just ideas. They're just ideal types. Um, and in reality, though, those two paradigms uh, are almost always in play at some stage in the juvenile justice system. So even within a particular policy measure, you can often see ideas from both of those paradigms at play. So my own area of interest is restorative justice, which many of you will be familiar with, so things like youth justice conferencing and you can see within that idea of the Youth Justice Conference, both of, of these paradigms at play. So you can see that in a Youth Justice Conference, on one hand, it's designed to be rehabilitative, it's designed to address the criminogenic needs of the young person. On the other hand, the young person has to sort of be confronted by their victim and they have to you know, make amends for the harm that they've caused. So you can see both of these things um, absolutely at play, even within one policy initiative. <laughs> 